So, Dan, it's October, and people who follow politics are going to start hearing a lot more about the so-called October surprise, which is basically something that comes along late in the campaign and potentially impacts the results of the race. You've been covering politics for a while. I wonder if there are some of the more memorable October surprises that not just impacted the race, but were really interesting that maybe some people might have forgot about? <laughs> That's a great question. And, and at this point, I'd have to scroll back through my memory to think about it. Um, <laughs> you know, certainly in 2000, uh, George W. Bush acknowledging a DWI when there were a DUI, I can't remember which it was, when he was a younger man, shook up that race. And I think that the Bush team felt that that might have almost cost them the election. Yeah, it's remarkable to think that just a quarter century ago, that was such a big deal in a presidential campaign when, <laughs> you know, Tim Walz's was a one-day story in this race. Our politics have just changed so much since then. So true. I mean, it, I sometimes talk about politics is like a conveyor belt. And occasionally, you know, you pull something off and look at it for 10 seconds, and then there's something else that comes by. And that conveyor belt moves a lot quicker than it used to right now. Tell me about it. <laughs> Welcome to the Campaign Moment from The Washington Post. I'm Aaron Blake, senior political reporter and author of the Campaign Moment newsletter. It's Friday, October 4th. Today, I am joined by none other than Dan Balls, the chief correspondent covering national politics here at The Post. Hey, Dan. Hi, Aaron. So today we're going to talk about how some major current events off the 2024 campaign trail could impact that race like Hurricane Helene and the escalating tensions in the Middle East. And we're also going to talk about the newly unsealed legal filings that revealed new details about former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. So, Dan, I wanted to talk to you this week because you actually have been writing about this prospect of a outside event having a major impact on the campaign. And you wrote about this actually after the vice presidential debate on Tuesday, where a lot of us were focused on what was said during that debate, what it meant for the campaigns. And the point that you made was that this might be a less than important debate in large part because we are seeing some of these major external factors start to rear their heads. And, and specifically, you talked about the hurricane, you talked about the tensions in the Middle East, also a strike of the longshoremen, which has since been resolved, at least temporarily. I wondered, you know, looking back, how the scale of these kinds of events feel relative to previous elections. Is this like an unusual number of things happening all at once that could impact the race, or is it not really? Well, I, I was struck Tuesday as we were getting ready for the vice presidential debate that obviously the big story that day was the Iranian attack on Israel and the ballistic mis missile attack that they launched during the day, you know, a matter of hours before the debate. The political community, understandably, was completely focused on the vice presidential debate. But as I was thinking about it, I thought, A, vice presidential debates generally don't matter a great deal. Uh, and B, here we are with, you know, a major escalation in one of the tensest parts of the world happening at the very moment that when people are thinking that the vice presidential debate is what they ought to be focused on. And then, you know, we were days into the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, which has turned out to be just a horrific, horrific storm with huge damage. Again, uh, one of these major events, which sometimes does have political consequences, if, if not handled well. We remember what happened with George W. Bush and Hurricane Katrina and how, how his mishandling of that in the early days cost him politically, from which I don't think he ever fully recovered. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was the day that the Longshoremen's strike began. And as you say, it's been resolved at least temporarily. It's been pushed back into January until they revisit it. But what struck me was that these are the kinds of events that potentially have an impact on voters as they are thinking about the choices they have uh, for president. Yeah, and I think I should add, of, we mentioned the longshoreman strike. There was a lot of concern that the longshoreman strike could cripple the shipping industry and really kind of grind the economy to a halt if it persisted. But let's start with something that is still ongoing right now, and that is Hurricane Helene. Of all the news that's unfolded over the past week, the devastation of Helene might be what Americans are feeling most directly, 
especially in some key swing states, uh, North Carolina most notably, also Georgia in some key places. Those appear to be the states that have been hardest hit, and they're politically important as well. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are busy with the federal response to the storm, so much that it pulled Harris off the campaign trail very late in the campaign. Uh, I am here to personally take a look at the devastation, which is extraordinary. And it is um, and particularly devastating in terms of the loss of life that this community has experienced, the loss of normalcy, and um, the loss of critical resources. Dan, you mentioned Hurricane Katrina, which I think is the the example of something hurting a politician that most comes to mind. Are there other storms that have had some kind of an impact like this? I'm thinking to some degree of Superstorm Sandy in 2012, where, you know, Chris Christie, the New Jersey governor, the Republican, and Barack Obama working together, and Republicans thought that that kind of gave uh, Barack Obama some bipartisan credentials, you know, for his response to the storm. Are there are there other storms like that that you can think of actually kind of move the needle? Yeah, my recollection is that there was one during George H.W. Bush's presidency in Florida and that he was a little slow to deal with that, and he got a great deal of criticism as a result of that. I can't Hurricane remember. Hurricane Andrew, I think. I guess that was Hurricane Andrew. Obviously, Hurricane Katrina was was not during the middle of a presidential campaign. Right. It was after George W. Bush was reelected. Right. But it crippled his presidency. Uh, you know, obviously, the Iraq War did more than Katrina did. But but if you recall, it was Katrina that knocked his approval ratings down demonstrably and from which he didn't recover. So you mentioned Chris Christie and, and Barack Obama. That was another moment in which certainly the Republicans felt that a president and a governor doing what they are supposed to be doing in a moment of crisis like that had negative political overtones on the Republican nominee, Mitt Romney. But when these things happen, presidents have to do what they have to do. Governors have to do what they have to do. And and political parties and political campaigns have to get put set to the side. But they can have political overtones and political consequences. And, you know, we don't know whether, you know, Hurricane Helene is going to have that impact. Former President Trump tried to suggest that, you know, Governor Kemp in Georgia was having trouble reaching President Biden. We, we, we do need some help from the federal government. They have to get together, ideally with the governor. That governor needs to, uh, he's been trying to get them, and uh, I'm sure they're going to come through. But uh, he's been calling the president, hasn't been able to get him. But uh, they'll come through, I'm sure. Kemp basically said, no, no, I, you know, I was able to reach him, and we had a good conversation, and he's been very helpful. The president just called me uh, yesterday afternoon. I missed him and called him right back. And he just said, hey, what do you need? And I told him, you know, we, we got what we need. We'll work through the federal process. He, he offered that if there's other things we need, just to call him directly, which I appreciate that. But we've had FEMA embedded with us. So far, there's been no major criticism of the federal response. But this is one of these things that the longer it goes on, and given what we've seen, particularly in in western North Carolina, I mean, just the destruction there is going to require both immediate and sustained response. Uh, And so this is something that if you're Vice President Harris, you know, you have to be mindful of and you have to be thinking about, all right, what do I need to do? I'm not the president, but I am the Democratic nominee and I'm part of this administration. How much time do I have to devote to this? What are my responsibilities? How will it distract me from campaign travel? You know, it's one of those things that if you're a candidate, these things don't happen on anybody's particular political time or you know calendar. They happen, and you have to respond, and you have to adjust, and you have to adapt. And and if you if you are not nimble about that, and if you are not you know effective, and if you are not properly empathetic, you can pay a big price. It seems that Republicans, and and maybe this is kind of recency bias, but it seems that Republicans are trying really hard to manufacture in certain ways the idea that the federal government is asleep at the wheel here. You know, Trump is saying that basically North Carolina is not getting anything, that they're withholding funding. There is a claim floating around on Friday about FEMA funding having been diverted for immigration issues that isn't accurate. I just wonder if like the 
extreme kind of politicization of this issue shortly afterwards is just a reflection of where our politics are at. Like we have this storm a month before the campaign and and one side in particular immediately looks upon it as a a political wedge issue and something to be used in the campaign whereas maybe before they they let that things pan out a little bit before declaring these things to be massive failures. <laughs> Aaron, I think part of it is a reflection of the Trump era and and Trump himself, um, who is willing to say anything uh, for political advantage or personal advantage, frankly. I mean, he has a history of just making things up. So when you get into a situation like this, that's what he's going to do. Unfortunately, we're also in an era in which there are a lot of people who believe those things. And so it does have political consequences or can have political consequences. Now, for the most part, the governors, whether they, they're Democratic or Republican, have been fairly forthright about their sense that the federal government is doing what they need at this point. So there is pushback coming from Trump's own party. But that can get overwhelmed because Trump has a bigger megaphone. And as you say, we're, you know, we're now barely four weeks away from the election. This is a very, very tight election, and people are looking for any advantage they can get, even if they have to lie about it. And that's what Trump was prepared to do. I think it's also worth noting before we turn to some other issues, I think we've talked about the Trump criticisms of the federal response and how this could hurt Kamala Harris. There are ways in which this could potentially hurt Donald Trump, politically speaking. It seems kind of cruel to think about these things in in terms of brass tacks, but a lot of the more hard hit areas in the hurricane, you know, the areas with disaster declarations tend to be rural areas that vote for Trump. And if those areas are recovering and people aren't voting as much as they otherwise would in Georgia and North Carolina, you know, that can matter in a very close race. Our colleague Philip Bump crunched the numbers on this and found that the counties that were declared disaster areas actually supported Trump in the 2020 election by a nearly 16 point margin. So I wonder if you're the Trump campaign and you're, you know, getting your get out the vote effort into gear in these states. Are you worried about this impacting the race as well? I think you have to be worried about it. I mean, every vote is very, very important in this election, as we know, uh, given how tight uh, the battleground states have been and continue to be. One of the things we know about the Trump era and Trump politics is that he has been able to roll up enormous margins in smaller rural counties and not just percentage margins, but he's also been able to expand the vote in those areas that that more people have voted in those counties than had voted in, in previous elections. And so any individual county may look like it's fairly small in terms of population, but but if that's the way Trump has built his margins, any diminution of that could be very, very costly. And I think that they're, you know, they're going to have to be mindful of that and thinking about how do we make sure that we get as much of that vote as possible. And yet, you know, if, if you're people who are in those areas and you're worried about, you know, what's happened to your home, voting for president may not be the forefront of your mind. So it's a difficult situation politically for the Trump people. I don't know how much they're going to be able to do about that. Yeah. We should note that the states we're talking about here, North Carolina and Georgia, were very close in the 2020 election. North Carolina went for Trump by just more than a point, while Georgia was decided by less than a point. So, again, very fine margins that a lot of things can wind up mattering. We're going to take a quick break there. But when we come back, we'll be talking about some other events this week, including a newly unsealed court filing about former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. We'll be right back. So earlier this week, just hours before the vice presidential debate started, Iran launched a ballistic missile attack against Israel. The attack was in response to Israel's ground offensive in Lebanon that it says is directed at Hezbollah. It's the latest escalation in the year-long conflict since the October 7th Hamas attacks in Israel. And Israel has occasionally been a wedge issue for Democratic voters. I wonder, Dan, you know, we had in the spring, we had campus protests There was a lot of unhappiness with President Biden, and a lot of those things have kind of faded as this campaign has gone on. You know, we haven't seen the same kind of protests. Kamala Harris 
hasn't seemed to inherit as much of a divided Democratic Party on this issue. But I wonder, given the divides in the Democratic Party between, you know, preference for the Palestinian cause and the Israeli cause, if these escalations are going to kind of rip open that that division inside the party again, what are you seeing so far? Well, I think it has the potential for that, but certainly we haven't seen it yet. I think a couple of things. One, we're, you know, we're on the cusp of the first anniversary of the Hamas attacks on Israel uh, October 7th of last year. This is a moment in which even had the Iranians not launched their ballistic missile attack, I think people would have been focused on what has the year wrought in the Middle East and, and what are the consequences for, for the United States and, and, you know, certainly the rest of the world. For Vice President Harris, she has been able, in ways that President Biden was not able to do, she was able to kind of draw a, a firmer line on support for Israel, but at the same time, criticism of Israel for the way it had conducted the war in Gaza. And I think one of the potential consequences of what's happening at this moment is that it moves her, understandably, closer to full solidarity with Israel in being able to defend itself, but also in in able to deliver a response. One of the things we've seen over the last year is that for all of the influence that the United States seemingly has with Israel, the Biden administration has been unable really to in any way dictate the way Israel conducts the war. Prime Minister Netanyahu has done what he has wanted to do, often in the face of criticism or warnings from Biden and the administration about not going too far. And we know from just a week ago, President Biden was was quite concerned about the incursions into Lebanon by the Israeli Defense Force. And I think that for, for Vice President Harris, um, it creates the potential problem of people seeing a world in chaos and an administration that does not have the ability, for some understandable reasons, frankly, but does not have the ability to kind of rein it in and to bring things under control. And I think that, you know, chaos and instability are never are never good things for an incumbent administration when you're trying to gain essentially what is a, a, another term, as Vice President Harris is, is doing. So this Middle East issue, it's, you know, it's been boiling for a year. Uh, there is no end in sight, and, and there is great fear that this is going to continue to escalate and become something even wider and more dangerous. Yeah, and force some very difficult decisions for the administration. You know, I mentioned the splits within the Democratic Party. I also wonder, though, if this kind of thing could make it harder for Harris to distance herself from Biden. You know, she's actually been pretty successful in doing that on the margins and in some important ways. She does better on issues like the economy and immigration than Biden was doing people actually see her as the candidate of change in many ways. She's about as likely to be viewed as the candidate of change as Donald Trump, even though she is the sitting vice president. I wondered if you see this as kind of casting a spotlight on the fact that she is in the administration, uh, which is an argument that Republicans have been very keen on making. You know, she talks about change and you know, moving beyond the past decade, and they keep saying, well, you've been there for three and a half years. Why haven't you done something about these things? If you listen to J.D. Vance in the the vice presidential debate, you would think that Kamala Harris has been president for the last several <laughs> years because every criticism was of, of, of the Harris failure on all of these policies, uh, which, you know, fair game in a, in a political debate. But I think your point is a good one, Aaron, and and you use the the phrase on the margins that she's been able to put some daylight between herself and and Biden on the Middle East issue at the margins. And I think that's right. It it has been at the margins. And yet the margins have been interpreted, I think, in, in ways that make it seem as though it's even greater. And to her political advantage that in one way or another, she has not drawn the kind of criticism from the sort of people who are sympathetic to the Palestinian cause that Biden has. And I think that this has the potential to drive her closer to Biden because this is a question of Israel's right to defend itself and Israel's right to retaliate. Everything we have heard from her this week on this topic 
has been, you know, almost a pure echo of everything we have heard from President Biden. There has been no daylight between the two of them, and I and I think that that's kind of predictable given the circumstances of what has just happened. But as this plays out, and it will play out, we'll have to see whether she feels any need to, you know, again, at the margins— put some daylight between herself and the president and or uh, do some at least mild criticism of Israel, depending on on what the response is and, and where things go from here. But, I mean, this is such a volatile situation at a crucial moment in the campaign that everything will be magnified. So she's in a situation where she doesn't have control of these events. She certainly doesn't have control of the, what the Israeli response is going to be. And to some extent, she doesn't have full control of how the administration is handling it or, or responding. She's, you know, she's in those meetings, but she's the vice president. She's not the president. So, Dan, we also learned this week new details about former President Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. This came in the form of a 165-page court filing that was unsealed by Judge Tanya Chutkin. It came from special counsel Jack Smith in the federal January 6th case. Smith is, of course, the prosecutor who has investigated Trump's efforts to overturn the election and whether Trump was criminally responsible for what happened on January 6th. First of all, let's get into some of the key new details. According to the filing, Trump allegedly said, quote, so what when he was told Vice President Pence had been moved to a secure location on January 6th. He also said on more than one occasion that the details didn't matter when it came to his fight to keep power. There was a really striking scene at the TCF Center in Detroit in which a Trump campaign official urges someone who suggested that the vote counts were accurate to basically find something that would allow them to file litigation. There's also lots more detail on people telling Trump that his claims were wrong and details about Trump's inaction as the riot at the Capitol was taking place. Some real new timeline details that I'd encourage people to check out at The Washington Post. Dan, what's your read on this? I feel like these criminal cases have really faded from people's minds and if they even had much of an impact to begin with. You know, this was a guy who was convicted in one of these cases in Manhattan. The other trials are not going to happen before the election. But we did have this very late reminder of these things that happened when Trump was president. And those things, at least in real time when he was president, seemed to make people judge him poorly, especially at the very end of his presidency. What's your read on, like, how much this Jack Smith filing actually matters and what are the kind of key things to pull out of this? Well, I I think I would answer that in two ways. I think in one sense, it matters a great deal. This new filing and the the evidence that you cited and some of those specifics are incredibly damning of the former president and a reminder of everything he and his allies, but particularly he did in the months after the 2020 election and that he has continued to make this false claim consistently as he did again this week, that he won the 2020 election. And this is the evidence that points to the opposite view, which is that he tried to subvert and overturn the election. So I think in that sense, it is it is it is very important. And it is a reminder to people of a terrible moment in the history of the country. Having said that, there isn't a lot of evidence based on everything we've seen over the last year and a half that this filing is going to have much impact politically. I think that it will certainly stir up people who, you know, who loathe Donald Trump and who think that what he did on January 6th and in the lead up to January 6th is criminal uh, and that he should be prosecuted. This will register very strongly with them, and I think legitimately so. But for many other people, and particularly people who are supporters of President Trump, I don't think this will matter much at all. Yeah, I do wonder if there is a sliver of casual voters out there who maybe haven't tuned into these things to some degree. I looked at polling during the, you know, after the indictments and as these cases were progressing, and it showed that a lot of independent voters especially really didn't have much of a concept of what these cases were about. But on the other hand, you know, this is a momentary filing, and uh, we are not going to see a bunch of new filings in the final month of the campaign. I do think it's interesting, though, that the Democrats have been focusing on this issue more than they have in recent months. You know, back when Biden was 
the nominee. There was a lot of talk about how Trump was a threat to democracy. And they really seemed to back off of that for a while. But in recent days, we've seen not just this filing, but also Kamala Harris campaigning with Liz Cheney, who, of course, was one of the leaders of the January 6th committee who focused extensively on that issue in her remarks, you know, the idea that Trump is dangerous to democracy. So it's going to be interesting to see if Democrats kind of grab hold of this issue down the stretch of the campaign in a way that they hadn't for several weeks after Harris got into the race. Yeah, I think that's a very, a very important question. I, it, it has been striking the degree to which January 6th has come, you know, come kind of roaring back into into the discussion during this campaign. And I don't know whether it is simply an accidental confluence of events or a change in strategy. I mean, we 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 know that when Harris succeeded Biden as as the at the top of the ticket, she was clearly downplaying the issue of democracy to try to focus on some other things. And if you think about, you know, his speech at the Democratic Convention versus her speech at the Democratic Convention, he focused very much on on the state of democracy and Trump's threat to democracy. She did not do much of that. And you know, the most you know, the most viral moment from the vice presidential debate was the exchange between Walls and and, and Vance on January sixth. He is still saying he didn't lose the election. I would just ask that. Did he lose the twenty twenty election? Tim, I'm focused on the future. Did Kamala You know, I, I thought it was by far Vance's worst moment in a debate in which he had otherwise performed pretty well. But this was, again, this was not something raised by Walls himself. This was a question from right. the moderators that happened to come at the very end. It did produce something that has had, you know, at least days of impact. And I think that the big question is, is this something that Harris is now going to continue to try to run with? Or is, is this a week in which it just happened that all of these events occurred within a matter of days? And then, you know, they get kind of reset to where the Harris campaign had been prior to that. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and the Walls campaign focused on this. I think in large part because the rest of the debate wasn't necessarily as great for them, and this was <laughs> right. kind of what they had to work with a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I also think it's just remarkable that, you know, if you had told us four, four years ago that you and I would be talking about how January 6th had made a surprise return to the 2024 campaign as an issue, how kind of insane that would sound to us, that this wasn't the major focus of the 2024 campaign. But I think that's just a reflection of how unusual of a race this is and how fast things change in politics. But we're going to have to leave it there for now. Thanks so much for joining me, Dan. Aaron, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Dan Balls is chief correspondent for The Washington Post. If you want more campaign analysis, make sure you're subscribing to my newsletter, also called The Campaign Moment. You can find a link in our show notes and at postreports.com. And if you don't already, make sure that you subscribe to the Campaign Moment podcast feed so you never miss an episode like this one. And if you like the show, please rate it and review it and even share it with a friend if you can. Today's episode was produced by Eliza Dennis and mixed by Sam Baer. It was edited by Lucy Perkins and Mary Jo Murphy. I'm Aaron Blake. Have a great weekend. Mm-hmm.